Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in for my presentation. Um, I'm Grazian Krishan, uh, and today I'll be talking about using conditional variables uh, in real-time applications, some of the problems we've encountered uh, using them in real-time applications, and some of the solutions we've implemented in LibRTPI. Um, to give you a bit of context about me, uh, I work for NI. Uh, we recently got rebranded from National Instruments to NI. Uh, and I make hardware and software uh, for test measurement and automation markets. Uh, I've been with the real-time OS group uh, for the past uh, decade or so, uh, and we're using preemptrt-based Linux kernels on our real-time hardware. Uh, we're proud to support the real-time Linux collaboration project. Um, and uh, we uh, use that on ARM and x86 architectures. Uh, we use Open Embed and Yocta to build uh, our distribution. Um, for the past couple of years, I've been the maintainer for the Linux kernel shipping on our RT hardware. And in that capacity, I often debug nasty real-time issues. And too often, they're related to locking primitives and conditional variables, which is the subject of today's presentation. Uh, in terms of agenda for today, I, I'll very quickly uh, cover just some real-time concepts that are relevant for today's presentation and then some details about conditional variables and the associated concept of monitors. And um, then I'll go uh, more depth into uh, the problems we'd encounter, encounter with using conditional variables in uh, the LibPthread implementation, uh, our re-implementation re of LibRTPI, and then I'll close out with uh, some future ideas and questions. Uh, please submit your uh, questions uh, in the chat window. I'm doing this presentation live. I probably won't be able to answer you uh, necessarily uh, during the presentation, but I'll make sure uh, we have enough time at the end to answer questions. And if we don't, then we can uh, move over to the Slack channel and continue the discussion. Um, so very broadly, in uh, very general terms, a real-time system is a system that needs to interact uh, with the real physical world. And if you have a system that needs to interact with the real physical world, uh, then you must have a way to synchronize with it. Um, so one of the most important attributes of a real-time application is uh, what's called having a deterministic response to a stimulus. So if an event happen, happens and then um, the time it takes until between the event and the action uh, taken by the system, we measure that as latency and we want that latency to be predictable uh, but even more importantly, we want that latency to be bounded, to have an upper bound. Um, because if it's bounded and, and we, can, we, we can know in advance what the laten max latency is going to be, then we can design our real-time application in such a way to uh, meet the demands of synchronizing with the real physical world. Um, traditional re real-time applications uh, tend to tend to be uh, pretty simple things. Uh, you usually have a desired value you're trying to control the system output for, um, and, and you just have a simple control loop, uh, sometimes open loop control, sometimes closed loop control if you have a sensor in the loop. But the point I was trying to make on this slide is um, traditional applications used to be simple things, and that's not the case anymore. Uh, real application, real time applications today's world have become these complex things that involve uh, uh, basically autonomous driving and landing rockets and controlling smart grids at the country level. So you have complex actuators and you have complex sensors like cameras and, and GPS and radar, and you have to do sensor processing and, and do complex filters and uh, image recognition and so on. Oftentimes within your real-time application, you have to construct a model of the world. Um, and, and ha you have planners and executors, and oftentimes you have AI and ML in the loop or hardware in the loop. Um, so the point I'm trying to make on this slide is, well, number one, preemptive uh, and Linux, it's ideal for solving this type of real-time applications. It enables this type of uh, applications uh, because we preempt RT and Linux, you can take advantage of, of the rich ecosystem you find in Linux of, of drivers and libraries and databases and ML libraries and so on. Um, but for the purpose of this uh, presentation, uh, the, point, the other point I wanted to make is, uh, if you look at this slide, uh, there's a lot of data movement that needs to happen between all these components in these uh, systems. Um, 
So basically what the pattern you see uh, implemented over and over again is, is uh, solving this bonded multiple producer consumer problem, um, but with RP constraints. Um, so you have uh, consumers waiting for data to become available from sensors and you want the consumer that's running at RT5 or 50, your real-time thread, to have access to that data first uh, when that happens. Um, and one of the fundamental questions when you solve the uh, uh, bonded consumer producer uh, producer consumer problem is how can a thread wait for a condition to be true? How can one of those uh, consumers waiting for data know uh, when new data is available in the share uh, queue? Um, there's multiple ways ways to solve this. Uh, one way you could do it is by having the thread spin until the condition becomes true. Um, that is very inefficient and it actually can be actively detrimental if you have an RT thread spin because it can live lock a CPU. Um, a much better solution would be to have an explicit queue uh, where threads can put themselves on and, and wait for some state of the execution to become, uh, to happen. Um, so that's called waiting on a condition. And then you, some other thread, when it changes the set state, it can wake one or more of these waiting threads by signaling the condition. So one of the most common way, ways to solve this problem is uh, basically by using conditional variables. Uh, so very briefly, a conditional variable, it's a synchronization primitive uh, that provides a queue for threads to wait for a resource. Um, and the operations you can do on a conditional variable are wait, uh, which adds the calling thread to a queue and puts it to sleep, uh, potentially with a timeout. And then the converse operations are signal, which removes the thread from the queue and wakes it up, or broadcast, which uh, wakes up all um, the threads that are waiting on that uh, wake queue. Um, what you'll encounter in practice more often uh, is something called a monitor. Um, which is a synchronization construct that allows to threads to have both mutual exclusion and the ability to wait for a certain condition. Uh, so a monitor is composed of a lock object, uh, which provides the mutual exclusion, that's a mutex, and one or more conditional variables, which provide the cues for a thread to wait on for a condition to become true. After atomically releasing the mutex, that part is important. Uh, higher level languages like uh, C sharp and D, um, support monitors natively. Um, in C and C++, they must be constructed from mutex and a conditional uh, variable. Um, so a bit more about monitors. Um, there's a design rule associated with monitors. You can have multiple conditional variables associated, uh, associated with the same mutex, but not vice versa. If you think about it, the mutex is there to protect the integrity of the underlying share, underlying share resource, the queue, the buffer, whatever. Uh, but you can have multiple wait queues. You can have consumers wait uh, on, on the empty condition if the queue is empty. And, and when a producer adds more data in, it will signal this empty condition and the consumer knows, hey, more data is available. Uh, I can uh, go read it. Uh, and, as, uh, and conversely, you can, have that, you can have a full condition for producers to know uh, when, when more space is available in the shared resource and they can do their job. Um, the, in theory, there's two styles of monitors. Um, one is called uh, Hore style monitors. This is what you'll find in most theory. Uh, in this style of monitor, uh, the signaler uh, passes the lock to the waiter uh, when it does the signaling, and the waiter can run immediately. Uh, and because of this handoff, the waiter, um, the condition is guaranteed to hold while the waiter uh, runs. Um, and the waiter can do his job and give the log back to the signaler uh, when it exits the critical section or wants to wait again. Um, what you'll find in practice a lot more often uh, is something that's called a MESA style monitor. Most real time OSs implement this um, because it's more practical to implement. And in this style of monitor, the signaler keeps the log while it's doing the signaling. The waiter is simply put on the ready queue for the associated log and might have to wait for that lock again uh, before it can run. And it must, because of that, it must recheck the underlying condition. So uh, if we express MESA style monitors in pseudocode, it will look something like this. Uh, for the singular, uh, making a resource available side, the singular side, um, you take the lock, uh, 
you 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 make the resource available for let's say if you're a producer thread you add more data into the shared uh, queue and then you signal the the associated condition and then you unlock the uh, associated mutex uh, pretty straightforward on the single impact signaling path sorry um on the waiting path on the waiting for a resource path uh, things are a bit more complicated what you need to do is you lock the associate uh, uh, mutex that protects the underlying resource. Uh, you check if the condition, uh, if the resource is available or not, and if it's not, you then call wait, and this wait call will automatically release the mutex and wait on that conditional variable. Uh, and after you wake up, you have to recheck that condition because spurious uh, wakes up, wake ups are allowed with Mesa style mon uh, monitors. And assuming everything is okay and resources available, you can uh, do your work and unlock the associated mutex. Um, there's an additional constraint if you use monitors and conditional variables uh, with uh, in real time design. And that is you want these uh, various threads waiting on these various con uh, conditions and these various wait queues, you want them to wake up in their priority order. So if, if new data gets added by a producer into the queue and, uh, and the consumers were waiting uh, uh, on that empty condition, we want that artifact for 50 consumer to wake up first and have first dibs for that data before the other uh, sketch other threads, for example, that are waiting on the same condition. Um, the other important concept uh, in, in real-time design when we're talking about threads and locking uh, is the concept of priority inversion. Um, so this, this is a situation that can occur if you have uh, threads of different priorities and they have a shared lock. So what I have on this graph, I've represented the, on the y-axis priority and I've rep I have uh, three threads in there, T1, T2, T3. Um, the, the filled up boxes represent uh, portions where that thread runs and the empty boxes re uh, represent uh, portions where that thread is schedulable, but it cannot run for whatever reason. So in this example, uh, our lowest priority thread, T1, starts running at some point. No, nothing else is running on the system. Uh, so even though it's the lowest priority thread on the system, it can, it can get scheduled in and start running. And let's say this thread, um, at some point, uh, at time T1 acquires lock L. Uh, starts doing its job uh, accessing the shared resource. But in the meantime, th uh, thread three T three becomes runnable, um, and then it, uh, because it's higher priority, it preempts uh, our T one thread. Uh, so it starts running, it does some work, and then it tries to access the same uh, shared resource. So it's, it's trying to access the underlying um, and, and lock the underlying lock L. Um, but because lock L is still held, uh, being held by uh, thread T one, it cannot do that. So it blocks and the scheduler has to put this thread uh, uh, to sleep, waiting for that lock to be released. Now, in the meantime, uh, uh, an intermediate priority thread T2 can come in and, and because it is a higher priority than, than our lowest priority thread T1, it will get scheduled. T3 cannot run because it get, it's blocked on waiting on lock L, uh, but T2 can get scheduled in and it can run for an unbounded amount of time um, it's not connected to our T1 and T3 T threads. It doesn't need the shared lock. It can, it can run forever and it can preempt basically our high priority thread from doing its job because it's waiting on the lock L and it preempts the lower priority thread to finish its work and it cannot release lock L. So only when the, the intermediate thread T2 releases, uh, releases the CPU, the scheduler, uh, can our lower priority thread T1 uh, finish its work, release lock L, and then um, T3 can, our high priority thread can, can finally run. Um, so you can see in this diagram that T3 was, had an unbounded amount of time where, where it was preempted to run and, and it created an unbounded uh, latency, which is a bad thing in real time uh, design. Uh, so the way this is solved uh, in Linux with preempt RT and, and um, is, basically this algorithm that's called priority inheritance. Um, so in this scenario, uh, as before, T1 starts running, it acquires the associated lock L, um, it gets preempted by T3, but then at the point where T3 blocks on the lock L, um, 
the priority of our low priority thread that's called in that log gets boosted to the priority of our high priority thread. So the priority of T1 now becomes the priority, it, it, the priority of T3 becomes now the priority of T1. T1 runs at T3's priority. And because of that, it cannot be preempted by this intermediate priority thread, uh, T2. Um, so uh, it, it can uh, finish its work quickly, release the lock, and at a point it releases the lock, it gets deboosted, and our uh, high priority thread T3 can acquire that lock and start running. Um, the, the algorithm behind this is fascinating. I encourage you to go uh, in the kernel uh, code and kernel documentation and read about this. Uh, the important point I wanted to make for the purpose of this presentation, though, is that uh, having locks without priority inheritance is really bad for real-time design because it can create these unbounded, unbounded latency situations. Um, so we get to our first problem that we encounter with uh, conditional variables when you use uh, libp thread. Um, it was discovered back in around 2009, uh, Hart and, uh, and a bunch of other real-time folks. I apologize, I'm not naming here. Uh, I wasn't involved at the time, so I, I, can't, I don't remember everybody. Um, so they discovered that uh, p thread conditional variables has the potential of uh, priority inversions. They, they are not priority inheritance aware, the problem was with an internal lock that's used to uh, protect the internal structure associated with a conditional variable. And that internal lock, even if you use the user mutex with priority inheritance, that internal lock did not have priority inheritance. And it could create these uh, priority inversion situations and, and unbounded latencies. Um, so uh, Darren and the other real-time folks involved at the time um, work with the kernel folks and, and uh, solve this on the kernel side and on the, uh, in the GLibc and they put those, some patches together that are actually attached to this uh, bug. Um, and they started uh, working with the GLibc folks trying to uh, upstream this fix. Um, so, uh, so on the kernel side, uh, two new Futex operations got added. Uh, I'll talk more in depth about them later in the presentation, uh, but uh, just briefly, Futex compare EQPI can be used for signaling. Um, and a few text wave EQPI can be used for waiting, and they both uh, implement this priority inheritance uh, algorithm I talked about. Um, so they started working through uh, trying to upstream those patches. At some point, I came in and I tried to help too. Um, I migrated the patches to the latest GLC at the time and resubmitted them. Uh, there was back and forth about uh, getting the right copyright assignments in place with the uh, uh, Free Software Foundation, and we worked with lawyers and we solved all that. But in the meantime, um, there was another uh, bug that was filed against uh, libp thread and conditional variables. And um, it turns out that at the time, uh, it was possible for a p thread con wait call um, that happened after a p thread con signal call uh, to consume that signal. Um, and I've linked the, the associated bug here, um, and the slides are going to be available online, so you can go check it out for yourself. There was a long discussion that spanned, uh, I guess, over five years. Uh, if I look at the dates on this bug, it's, well, it's more like six or seven years. Uh, it was it was a pretty heated discussion. If I understand the underlying situation correctly, the, the issue was caused by by some sequence counters that were used in GLibc to keep track of uh, how many signals were sent and how many threads were woken up. G, uh, libp thread and GLibc were trying really hard to avoid spurious wake-ups, even though they are allowed uh, per uh, MESA monitor um, design and per POSIX for that matter. Um, and because of these counters and spurious wake-ups, it was possible for a p thread on wait uh, to consume a signal. Uh, so uh, the discussion on this bug got really heated and then it spilled over into a POSIX uh, defect uh, that got filed with the Austin group. And there was a, a lot of discussion there happening there too. For a while, it looked like there was uh, some consensus on clarifying POSIX uh, to, uh, to describe when it's a thread considered to be blocked with respect to a p con signal or p con broadcast. Um, and I think the consensus at the time was like, p con signal or p con broadcast will, will determine at some point during their execution uh, which threads are blocked on a conditional variable, and they'll make sure to wake up one of those blocked thread, threads um, and not, not the thread that comes in and waits on the conditional variable after. 
anyway, the POSIX issue is actually still open. That last update you see there is from 2016, and it's me actually asking a question if, if there's a, a consensus on this. Uh, but regardless, uh, GLC went ahead and uh, fixed the bug that I mentioned earlier uh, by implementing this uh, algorithm that I'm trying to explain here. Uh, so what this algorithm in, in, in the current implementation of GLC and Lipitra tries to do is make sure that the happens before relationship, it's, it's in, uh, really enforced uh, between waiters and signalers. Um, so in this algorithm, um, all waiters start in this non-eligible group called G2. Uh, so you have two waiters there uh, in, in those diagrams uh, in the upper left corner, W1, W2. They come in, they get put into non-eligible group, non-eligible group. Um, so only when uh, all the previous waiters that were in the active eligible waiter group, uh, that's group G1, um, have been signaled, the next signal that comes in will take all the waiters that were in, in, in the non-eligible group, in the group G2, and move them to the group G1. And the signals will start uh, signaling waiters in this eligible group, in the group G1. So if a new waiter comes after the signal S1, and now we're looking at the diagram in the upper right corner um, on, on this slide, uh, if a new waiter W3 comes in, it will get enqueued in this non-eligible group G2, and a new signal that comes in after that, S2, will continue to signal the waiters that are uh, uh, in the G1 group. Um, and only after every, everybody that was waiting in the G1 group is signaled, then our waiter that got enqueued in uh, W3, waiter that got enqueued in our G2 group, uh, gets moved into the active group G1, and it, it can then get signaled by signal S3. Uh, so this scheme guarantees uh, fairness in terms of like waiters that start uh, waiting earlier, uh, they'll they'll consume uh, signals before other waiters that come in later, and definitely enforces that happens before relationship, but it has a huge problem uh, when it's used for RT design, for for designing RT applications, and that is uh, if you have a new RT priority waiter that comes in and you already have a bunch of waiters waiting to be signaled in, our, in the eligible group, in the group G1, um, our WRT waiter, our high priority waiter will get enqueued in, in this second group, in the group non-eligible group, in the group G2. And uh, you can already see the problem here. This is a priority inversion, basically, because our high priority uh, RT waiter, even though came in before signal two, and, and all the way to signal N, it won't get signal until everybody else got signal that came before it. Um, in the real time application, what we would like to happen is if, if an RT, new RT waiter comes in, that's S2 signal there, we would like that to wake up the RT thread, even though there were other waiters that had waited longer, we care about the priority of the threads uh, in a real time uh, design. Uh, so this creates a priority inversion by design. And as this is a big problem if you're using GLIPC and LIPP thread past version 2.25. Um, and this puts uh, our RT folks in, in a bind because basically if they want to use conditional variables and have proper behavior, um, now, now you're, you're in big trouble if you want to upgrade your GLIPC past version 2.25. Um, there's another issue with the current implementation of uh, conditional variables in LIPP thread, and that is for, uh, for signaling and for broadcast operations on the slow path, they use a few text wake operation. Um, and what that uh, creates is basically a thundering herd effect because you're on a, a, like, let's say you do a broadcast and you have a bunch of waiters, they will all wake up at the same time and race to acquire the associated mutex and you have this thundering herd effect, which is bad for, again, for um, RT use cases. So, uh, nevertheless, the uh, uh, Torvald Regal implemented this new scheme in GLIPC, and he presented on it at the RT Summit in Berlin, I believe, in 2016. Uh, we raised our objections, but even with that, uh, the new implementation got merged in. And um, the last comment on on the bug that that's, that we care about, the, the one about conditional variables not having priority inheritance, the last comment there says, there's no known solution on how to achieve priority inheritance with the current design of GLIPC, given the current constraints, 
Um, GLC is also constrained uh, in terms of changing the associated structure that's associated with conditional variables because uh, the structure size is part of the GLC API. Uh, so there's no known solution uh, at this point for how to achieve PI support uh, given the current constraints uh, we have available, few tax halves, posing requirements, and so on. So, um, to make matters somewhat worse, uh, if you uh, look at the other locking primitives available in libptrad, uh, you'll notice that with the exception of ptrad mutex, uh, where you can enable priority inheritance via mutex attribute, and in that case, it uses lock uh, PI primitives like futex lock PI and unlock PI. All the other primitives, uh, locking primitives in libptrad and glibc, uh, use futex operations that are not that don't have priority inheritance. They're, they're not RT friendly. Um, so you cannot use conditional variables and you don't have the option to use semaphores or something else to implement uh, your producer consumer patterns or whatever other reason you might want to use a conditional variable for. Um, so uh, I presented on this problem at the RT Summit in 2017. Uh, this was in Prague. Uh, I linked the video there if you're curious to see my presentation back then. Um, and, and basically lay this out, basically, hey, if you're an RT and you have properly behaved conditional variables, uh, you cannot upgrade uh, GLIPC pass version 224 without running into these unbounded latency issues with conditional variables. Uh, so uh, Sebastian uh, put together a meeting with Darren, Peter, Julia, me, and hopefully I'm not forgetting other people, some of the interested RT folks uh, that were at the RT Summit at the time. Um, and we we talked about it and basically said, okay, we've been at this now for almost 10 years. Uh, we, 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 we try to upstream uh, our solution to GDPC, but GDPC now has different requirements and POSIX is moving in a different way that's uh, contradictory with the real-time requirements we have. Maybe it's time to stick a, take a step, a step back and try a standalone implementation that narrowly solves uh, this problem for RT application and lets people upgrade their glibc and and use uh, um, conditional variables in parallel uh, with the updated glibc. Uh, you don't want to be stuck on an old glibc, obviously for security reasons and so on. Um, so Darren uh, put together the initial spec uh, and the GitHub project um, that I linked there, and and Sebastian and Julia worked on fleshing it out at Summit on the Summit in 2018. And then um, Darren and Julia presented a status update that I linked there at Linux Plumbers in 2018. And in the intervening time, I've been uh, working to, uh, with Darren to add uh, more uh, test cases. I've imported the GLFC test cases that are used for conditional variables. And um, we, we talked about tweaking the API at the last TLC in, in 2019 in San Diego, uh, because we, we had a corner case that wasn't completely solved by the API we picked. Uh, related to process share conditional variables. Um, I added more tests and some fixes and so on. And uh, here we are today, another ELC. I'm, I'm presenting uh, our, our current status and um, the progress we've made. Uh, you might notice this is uh, conference different de uh, driven development. Um, so our, our design goes behind uh, LibRTPI um, where First and foremost, uh, we want the priority inheritance by default. That guarantees us uh, basically uh, bounded latencies and good uh, real-time behavior. We want the waiters to be woken in priority order. Um, a deviation from POSIX, we mandated that the signaler must hold the lock. POSIX only mandate, it's, it's optional if you use POSIX conditional variables, if the signaler side actually holds the lock while it's doing the signaling. Uh, but if you aren't properly ordered and behaved real-time applications, you want to order signalers with respect to waiters. So it's important to hold the associated lock. Uh, we wanted to avoid thundering herd effects, so use uh, PI, prefutex PI primitives. Uh, we decided to default to clock monotonic for uh, time weights. Um, if you're familiar with uh, uh, GLFC and PTRAD conditional variables, um, they use clock real-time for time weights, and that can actually uh, be uh, uh, problematic in, in real-time applications, despite the name clock real-time, uh, because in reality, that's that's wall clock time and, and it can go backwards, it can uh, jump, and that's time uh, that's bad for timeouts. Um, so uh, you're much safer as a default to use clock monotonic. 
Um, we decided to use opaque data types to allow for future ex expansion. We didn't want to be painted in the same corner Julie C got uh, painted in, uh, where yeah, they couldn't make improvements because the structure size is part of the ABI. Um, and uh, we decided to keep the API as close as possible to POSIX to facilitate porting, but we intentionally didn't overload the existing PTRAD cond API. We didn't do some uh, LD preload tricks or anything like that. We wanted the porting to libart API to be explicit, and 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 you you can use uh, uh, libptrad convars and libart API convars in parallel, not combined together, but in parallel they, they can be used in the same application. So uh, we decide to allow for for that use case. Um, in terms of license, build, and test. Um, Libart API is licensed under LGPL. Uh, we decided to do that uh, because it makes it possible to link and reuse GLibc code. Um, and we've done that by importing the GLibc tests and, and some of the code we had already contributed to GLibc. Um, and it's also broadly usable uh, in, in the industry. It's um, what everybody uses in terms of uh, lib -thread. Um uh, we, uh, Darren set up an auto tools build system uh, for this project and uh, thread the CI uh, for running tests on GitHub. Um, in terms of uh, porting the code from POSIX Go to PI Mutex API, um, so uh, I, let me back up just a bit. We implemented two primitives in there, a PI Mutex and a PI conditional variable. So in, uh, if you're uh, porting POSIX Go to the PI Mutex API, um, unfortunately, there was some highlighting here that doesn't show up on this Intrado uh, uh, platform uh, that I'm presenting on. Uh, but basically, if you're familiar with the Ptrad API, the only difference you might notice on the left side is PI mutex in it takes a flags attribute when you're initializing a mutex instead of a mutex attribute object. Uh, we found that it's really cumbersome to uh, deal with creating uh, that mutex attribute object and, and then uh, setting flags and use it to initialize the mutex and then destroy it. It seemed unnecessary because from the get-go, we wanted this implementation to be very narrow and uh, narrowly scoped. So we don't expect a lot of flags that, that will get applied to a mutex. Uh, so we can accommodate with just a bit flag um, uh, attribute that we pass to in it. Uh, the destroy lock, try lock and unlock operations have the same um, the same uh, basically API as the lib ptrad, uh, ptrad mutex lock, ptrad mutex try lock, ptrad mutex unlock. Uh, one difference you might notice on the right hand side, we have uh, decided to provide some macros and, and some dynamic allocation of uh, API calls uh, for allocating a PI mutex. And that has to do with the fact that we wanted the underlying PI mutex, uh, the uh, data type to be an opaque data type. Um, so we provided allocators for it. Um, in terms of uh, implementation, it's actually pretty uh, straightforward. And uh, I have a link to the source code, uh, the GitHub source code at the end. You can go check it out. But it's not much more than what you see uh, on this slide for PI mutex lock. Uh, basically, uh, we're using the futex lock PI futex operation. And, and with this futex op, what you need to do, um, if the mutex is uncontented in user space, you can you can try to do an atomic uh, uh, compare and swap between the Futex word and our thread ID, our PID, and if that succeeds, it's, it's good. We own the uh, uh, mutex. If not, we have to call into the kernel, and the kernel has to put us uh, to sleep and do its priority inheritance algorithm and so on. Um, so um, basically, yeah, we try the compare and swap with PID. If we don't succeed, we go into the kernel, and kernel handles everything else for us. Um, the unlock implementation, um, it's basically the converse of the lock implementation. First, we try uh, an atomic swap uh, between uh, our PID and zero. There's some, uh, there's some error checks before that to make sure we actually own the lock. Uh, but, but we try this atomic lock, uh, atomic compare and swap. Uh, between our PID and zero to unlock the mutex, the mutex, yeah. And if that fails, uh, we just go into the kernel and let the kernel handle anything via everything via the unlock uh, PI futex operation, which does uh, priority inheritance and so on. Um, 
So yeah, pretty straightforward in terms of mutex implementation. In terms of uh, the actual Kanbar, which is the topic uh, of this presentation, um, again, um, the API looks very similar to the POSIX libp thread API. Uh, again, the, one of the differences is pi cond in it takes a flags attribute as opposed to a cond attribute, cond at attr, cond var attribute object. Uh, for the same reasons, we we only have a couple of flags, and this makes things easier. Uh, destroy con wait con time wait operations have the same uh, parameters that you will expect in a Pthread implementation. Um, one difference that you might see here compared to uh, the lib Pthread implementation of condars is we're passing in the associated mutex that's associated with the monitor associated with the convar uh, to the signal and broadcast calls. And why that's needed will become uh, uh, obvious in a couple of slides when I talk about the implementation. Uh, and again, for same as with mutexes, uh, we provide some static and dynamic allocators to allocate uh, a, a pi cond object. Um, in terms of implementation, let me start first with a few taxis calls that, uh, that are used uh, to implement this, uh, this conditional variable application. Uh, this conditional variables, because uh, it will make it easier to explain the implementation. So uh, the Futex is called used for signaling uh, is this uh, uh, Futex operation called Futex compare QPI. And what this, this operation does, um, it basically looks at all the waiters that are enqueued on the first parameter that's passed there, that's the U adder. Uh, that is our non-PI Futex where the waiters are queued on, that's our wait queue for the conditional variable. And then it wakes up uh, one of them, uh, the, the third parameter, their val, it's always one. Uh, for signal or broadcast, we want to wake up at least one. And then the, the four parameter val two, we pass in zero for signal, we just want to wake up one. And, and we pass in max for, for the broadcast case. And that represents the number of threads we want to requeue. We want to requeue all the threads in a broadcast situation on, on the uh, fifth parameter there, which is u adder two, which is our uh, user mutex. So what this system uh, call does is it wake up, if there's the waiters waiting on u adder one, wakes up one of them and it re the rest of them on u adder two. And the wake up is done in such a way as the, uh, to respect priority inheritance and wake up the uh, highest priority thread that was waiting there. Um, so uh, if we go back to the implementation of the PI con signal, it's not very complex. Um, the underlying structure has two fields in there. Uh, the count field, the count count, that, that is our uh, Futex word that we're waiting on. And uh, I'll come back to wake ID that's, that's used to detect races between signalers and waiters. We just record the current sequence count that's, that's stored in our count field. And then uh, all we do is call this Futex Compare QPI that does all the work for us in the kernel. And if everything well went well, the system call will return zero or, or a number greater than zero that represents the number of threads that got re-enqueued. Uh, if there was an error, we retry on it again, and otherwise we just return the error. Pretty simple in terms of the signal path implementation. Um, the, 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 the waiting side of, um, of the equation uh, uses this futex wait requeue-pi uh, futex operation, which is another operation that pretty much does everything we need. Um, so what this operation does is uh, it will enqueue the current thread on u adder one, and that's our wait queue. Um, the, the third parameter, the val uh, field, is just used to detect races, because uh, if you remember, we mess the style monitors, we have to release the associated mutex before we start waiting. Uh, so that, that value uh, lets us basically detect if there was a race. And then the fourth parameter is the timeout, if we have a, a wait with a timeout. And the fifth parameter there, u adder two, is our PI filtex where we want to get enqueued on on wake up. So then if we look at the implementation uh, for, uh, for our uh, wait, uh, basically what we do, we again increment the, the count uh, field that's used as our uh, wait queue and, and as our sequence count counter. 
Uh, we record what the wake ID was before we release the associated mutex. And then we just uh, do the syscall that puts us to sleep on, on that, uh, on that uh, few text that's associated with the conditional variable, which is our wake queue. And our return, if everything went well, we own the mutex uh, and every, we can just return. If there was an error, we have to reacquire the associated mutex because the POSIX semantics for, for waiting says that the wait call basically atomically resets the mutex weights and then reacquires the mutex, even in error cases. So we reacquire the mutex. Uh, we retry the again case unless we've raced with a signaler. And that's important for real time design uh, because if, if a waiter raced with a signaler, we want that waiter to stay awake and check the underlying condition that's associated with the CAN bar because that waiter might have been a, a real time thread and we don't want to miss a wake up. And, and the way we detect that is by, by checking the locally recorded wake ID. Uh, to the wake ID that's set in the CAN bar that's incremented every time the CAN bar is used basically uh, to signal. Uh, so that's pretty much it. If you look at in my uh, GitHub repo, that's what you'll see in terms of implementation. Uh, in terms of current status, uh, the GLIPC tests I ported, it's about, I think, 20 tests or something, uh, have been, and the API chains have been merged uh, in uh, Darren Hart's uh, GitHub repo. That's, that's our upstream for libRTPI. I still owe uh, Darren some pull requests uh, from my branch that I linked there. I have some small locking fixes. Um, there's a PI mutex fix I need to upstream related to the process share use case. Um, I've simplified the sequence quant counters. The initial implementation in Darren's repo has an internal private mutex that, that protects this internal state of the canvar. Uh, because we mandated in the API that the mutex is held for waiting and signaling, we can actually just use the user mutex to protect our state. Uh, so we don't need that internal mutex. So I simplify that. I've added clock real time support just to make more tests pass. Um, I've added cancellation support to make all the GLC tests pass, even though that wasn't part of the initial design, but hey. Um, so there's some more general cleanouts. All told, I, I still owe Darren about 25 commits. Uh, that you can check in my branch in, in that's linked in the slides here. Uh, so the current status, um, libRTPI, it's a very small library. It only implements this uh, priority inheritance mutex and priority inheritance combar. It can be used in parallel with libpthread. It's only 34 kilobytes. All tests pass, uh, as proof here, I, I posted a screenshot of the test suite. Uh, so yeah, like, uh, total 25 tests or so. Um, I put an asterisk on that because there's there's a test in here that's a bit flaky and it has to do with uh, with cancellations. Um, so uh, once everything is merged and sorted out, uh, we, if you notice here, the libRTPI version is 001, so we should probably do an official release. Um, it is currently using production, our version of this is using production and I. Um, so I encourage you basically um, and this is my last slide. I encourage you to, to test it, to start using it, uh, to contribute. Um, I, I've, I've linked here the, the two repos. Um, and in terms of future, I, I would like to open it up for discussion. Um, I'm interested if, if you're interested in uh, putting together a user space uh, type uh, toolbox for real time design. What I found in my experience is a lot of people reinvent the wheels. And for example, one of the most common things I've seen reinvented is having a shared uh, memory uh, queue that it can use between threads of different priorities. So maybe it's uh, maybe it's worth doing another small library that implements that in, in an RT set way. Other things that might be useful for RT. So really, uh, at this point, I'm going to open it up for questions, and I'll look. I'm looking forward to your ideas and questions. Uh, so let's see. Let's start going through here. Um, let's see. Uh, so the first question is, does other LIPC implementation have the same issues as GLC, uh, like Muscle? Um, no, I believe Muscle actually has a better implementation for Canvars. Um, the, the thing with using Muscle is, especially in like complex applications that have already existing pre-existing software that's linked against uh, libc you're kind of stuck with glibc which is kind of the de facto c runtime uh, but it, but if you can afford to move to muscle or some other implementation 
um, then yeah, I, I don't think it has the same kind of priority inversion issue as GDPC. But to be honest, I haven't personally used it, so I cannot guarantee that. It's just hearsay from other uh, Limpensel contributors. Um, let me see. Uh, the next one is there a performance difference? Uh, between uh, this implementation and the uh, LIPP thread implementation. Um, I haven't benchmarked it. Uh, it's kind of hard to benchmark condition variables because by their nature, they're just waiting on a condition to happen. I guess you could uh, benchmark uh, how well the or how quick the wake up is. Um, I suspect because the libpar TPI implementation is much simpler and pretty much it just calls into the kernel and doesn't do much else, that it should be quicker, but I have not tried it. I have not benchmarked it yet. Um, let's see, another question. Is there a timeout variant of the trilog? I'm assuming uh, we're talking here about uh, the uh, PI mutex implementation um no not well no yeah the, the there's no current implementation libra tpi for for a trilog with a timeout uh, but that will be really easy to add and pull uh, pull requests are well, uh, welcome uh, please uh, try it out and contribute it um or or yeah if you think it's something that's really useful we can think about adding it um let's see what else um, do groups still exist in libRTPI, RT threads, and then scat other ones into groups? Um, yes, you can use, um, uh, you, yeah, you can use scat other or scat five or whatever other scheduler, um, um, uh, you want with your threads and, in, and it should work with libRTPI. Um, you do get advantages, obviously, when you are interested in, in RT5 for threads and, and getting the proper wake up behavior. But uh, yeah, it, not all the threads need to be art, running at a SCAD5 or anything like that. They can be SCAD other threads. Uh, Darren Hartz is looking forward to, um, to the PRs, so I need to make sure I, I do that. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll start uh, sending you more PRs uh, your way. Darren, thanks for your help. Uh, it's been very helpful uh, having you review the changes I've made. Um, then let's see. Uh, will the first, uh, Thurston ask, will the first release be already be ready now enough to use in real time? products. And uh, I have to hope that the answer is a yes, because uh, like I mentioned on my previous slide, uh, this is actually currently shipping on NI products uh, for about a year or so now. As far as I know, there hasn't been any big fallout. So it's been testing in production, I guess. So go for it. Um, and then Roberto asks, what will you say it's a good first step to start contributing to RT with no prior Linux kernel development experience? Um, Roberto, what I'll suggest is basically find an issue that bothers you or something you're interested in and, and start picking on it. Uh, start looking through the source code uh, and, and, and start, start small and start uh, basically get your feet wet and, and just find an area that you're interested in, in, in the kernel and in the RT world and um, just try it out and, and start contributing. Um, then Randy, you mentioned the libRTPI is used in production. Are there any open source apps that you can point to? Um, no, I don't think he has wide adoption yet in open source and has uh, this presentation. Um, I'm, I'm trying to raise awareness about it. Right now it's been uh, the people that are, uh, uh, that, that go to RT Summit and, and are, in, are deeply embedded in the real-time uh, community uh, know about it. 
uh, but I don't expect there's a wide audience for it yet. So I don't know of any open source project that uses it yet. Uh, but I would love to if more there's more users and and we can make this really solid and 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 widespread and including in distros and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I think we're basically out of time. I encourage you guys to head over to the Slack channel for the embedded track. Uh, I'll be watching there and try to answer some of more of your questions. Um, thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, and it's been a pleasure presenting to you guys.